context of post-war or post-conflict reconstruction. Um, the discussion will be in English, so for anybody who needs uh, headphones or translation, الكلام حيكون بالإنجليزي إذا حدا بده ترجمة في headphones ورا. I'm Maha Yahya. I'm the director of the Carnegie Middle East Center. Um, today, the topic of the panel is very much about the politics of post-conflict reconstruction. And perhaps we'd like to emphasize here the issue of politics. Um, much of the discussion on reconstruction or post-conflict reconstruction is often couched uh, in a dialogue that presents it as simply a matter of financing or physical rebuilding. And what we're trying to do today is unpack a little bit the different levels at which one can speak about reconstruction, uh, how it can and will be presented or built, um, what lessons, you know, how, how do we approach this? Can we speak about a, uh, a conflict and then a post-conflict period? Uh, is there a rupture or a continuity? And these are, I'm just touching on some of the topics and some of the issues that my colleagues on the panel will speak about. But also, perhaps, um, one of the questions is, at least for us in Lebanon, is what, is the, what are the lessons that Lebanon, as a, as a country that went through 15 years of civil war, and here the issue also becomes is the, the, how, how does the type of war um, affect or impact also approaches to post-conflict reconstruction? There are some seats in the front. Um, so, in terms of Lebanon, the question becomes here is, what does, does Lebanon have any lessons to offer for post-conflict reconstruction? Um, I'm just going to say a few words about Lebanon before turning uh, over to my colleagues. The idea is that we'd each speak for a few minutes and then open it up for a Q&A uh, with, with all of you. I think in terms of Lebanon, maybe one of the uh, most obvious traits of the post-reconstruction era in Lebanon is the 1990 uh, agreement, the Ta'if agreement, was built very much or based very much on a broad approach to uh, no victor, no vanquished, which in political terms translated into a blanket amnesty. And the blanket amnesty wasn't just at the political level in the sense of no, no, no war crimes would be persecuted, but it was also at the level of how uh, at least the city Beirut was rebuilt, how the question of uh, population displacement, which was a major trauma of the conflict, were addressed and dealt with, but even how history is taught. Um, so we saw a reconstruction of a city center that um, in, in the process of rebuilding also uh, uh, took away much of the city's social history. Uh, and oral memory, I'm talking about Beirut in particular, we saw, we saw other models emerge in other parts of the country. Um, we saw, we until today, we have a history curricula does the, that does not touch on uh, the legacy of the civil war and what that meant. Uh, and we saw a, uh, a, a rebuilding process um, that did not try and if you like, did not try and address the kind of population separations that happened during the process of the conflict. And the question here, when we enter into a post-conflict phase, um, is the question, is reconstruction about rebuilding society as it was, or acknowledging the schisms that were created during the conflict and learning how to deal with them? Um, I'm going to stop here and um, just the, oh, sorry. One last question also is in the case of Lebanon, um, the, 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 one of the key issues also is what does the lack of impunity and accountability for crimes that were committed during the war imply for the post-conflict or post-war order? In the case of Lebanon, what it meant was many of those that were responsible for the conflict ended up in positions of power. Uh, and many of them treated state institutions as elements or war, war bounty. Uh, and 
for the longest time, the discussion about state institutions is very much about who has the right to what, rather than what vision do we have for a post-war uh, society. Um, the question here or becomes is what are the lessons learned from the Lebanese case study for other places in this region? Um, we have today Stephen Heidman, uh, Mark Lynch, uh, Dylan Priskel, and Jacqueline Perry. Um, Stephen, I'm going to start with a question to you, which is can we really speak of a post-conflict period in Syria? And what are the factors that will approach uh, reconstruction in Syria particularly, but also more broadly? Thank you. Thank you very much, Maha. Uh, and, and thanks to Carnegie for setting up this meeting and giving this, us this opportunity uh, to, to have this, this conversation. And thanks to all of you for joining us for it. Uh, can we talk about uh, a process of post-conflict reconstruction in, in Syria? In, in some respects, I think we have to recognize that the debate about post-conflict reconstruction is emerging even though we are not yet at the phase in which post-reconstruction has become a reality. Now, to be sure, significant elements of post-conflict reconstruction have already begun in Syria. To be sure, legal frameworks, regulatory frameworks, all kinds of elements of the infrastructure of reconstruction have already been put in place in Syria. But the conflict continues. And that creates a context in which what we often think of as a sequential process in which conflict ends and reconstruction begins is not the way post-conflict reconstruction is unfolding in, in Syria. And that turns out to create an, an extraordinarily interesting context in which an enormous number of very, very difficult challenges have arisen around the question of how to structure reconstruction, how to pay for reconstruction, which actors will play what kind of roles in reconstruction, and so on. And I just wanted to say a little bit about some of these issues and tensions that have emerged in the debate around reconstruction and, and to see if they offer us any, any opportunity to gain some visibility into how the process of reconstruction might unfold over a period of the next year, two years, three years, and so on. From the regime perspective, I think it's very clear that reconstruct, the Assad regime perspective, it's very clear that reconstruction is viewed as what I would call a dual purpose project. It is about rebuilding the country. It is about, in particular, rebuilding the economy. But it's also about the reconstruction of authoritarianism in Syria. It's about the reassertion of the Assad regime's sovereignty and the reassertion of the Assad regime's authority over the entire territory of pre-war Syria. And the regime faces some significant constraints in trying to implement those different aspects of how it shapes and defines the reconstruction agenda. Two constraints stand out. One is very simply a resource constraint. Reconstruction, the reconstruction bill in Syria is widely assumed to be about $300 billion. There isn't any possible way in which the Assad regime, or even its most committed supporters, Iran, Russia, China, can provide more than a fraction of that, of that money. There is, in addition, a capacity constraint on the part of the regime. State institutions have been weakened. The Assad regime government itself has been weakened as a result of the conflict. Its capacity to um, to govern across the entire territory of Syria has been weakened. And so these are some very, very important issues that have shaped how the Assad regime has engaged in the diplomacy and politics of reconstruction because the intent has been to try to find ways to use the leverage of their international patrons and um, and other arguments, what I call, in fact, protection racket arguments, 
to try to compensate for their capacity problems and their resource problems. What's a protection racket uh, strategy? Essentially, the Assad regime is telling the international community that if you do not provide us with funding for reconstruction, we will unleash radicals and refugees into Europe, outside of Syria. You will pay a price for your failure to support reconstruction. This is, this is part of, of what I'm talking about. From the Russian perspective, the challenges of reconstruction are really focused around normalization of the Assad regime, around the relegitimation of the Assad regime, and again, in alignment with the regime itself in using reconstruction to enhance the sovereignty and legitimacy of the regime. And that has defined the, the strategy that the Russians have, have used in engaging in reconstruction diplomacy with external actors, with the EU, with the UN, uh, to a much lesser extent with the United States. But they absolutely see reconstruction as an opportunity not only to get themselves off the hook financially for the cost of rebuilding, but as a way to advance this political agenda. From a Western perspective, from a US and EU perspective, Reconstruction is seen as an opportunity to try to respond to the conditions that contributed to the onset of conflict in the first place. It is seen as an opportunity to impose conditions on the Assad regime that are on one level seen as opening up possibilities for securing concessions from the Assad regime on what the structure of a post-conflict political order will look like, but on the other hand are also intended to ensure that the resources committed to reconstruction are not used in ways that reinforce the legitimacy of the Assad regime and reinforce the sovereignty of, of, of the Assad regime in an unconditional, uh, unconditional fashion which contributes to this process of reconstructing authoritarianism. In, in, in effect. So, in short, because I know we were supposed to be short, re reconstruction has become this domain of contestation uh, in, around which these competing political agendas engage one another. And I have to say that I think the, the likelihood that we will find a pathway toward an effective strategy of reconstruction that responds to the tensions and differences in how these various actors perceive of reconstruction, the different agendas they bring to reconstruction, I think the odds of that happening are relatively low. I think we are in for an extended period in which we will see deadlock between critical actors and an inability to bridge differences around a strategy forward with reconstruction. And of course, the big concern, and this is my last comment on this, is twofold. One of the consequences of this deadlock is that little progress will be made in the medium term to address the conditions that contributed to the onset of conflict meaning that the likelihood of a recurrence of conflict will go up. The other is that the regime and Russia in particular, but, but Iran and China as well, will simply step back from their efforts to secure the participation of Western actors in processes of reconstruction. And this will, have, will also have important consequences because I think it means that the opportunity to try to, to use reconstruction in ways that might uh, consequentially significantly respond to the causes of violence in Syria will be lower. I think the opportunity to use reconstruction in a way that will temper this ambition of the Assad regime to use it to reconstruct authoritarianism will be lower. And so I think the likelihood
uh, if we are not able to find a pathway toward the resolution of these different agendas, reconstruction agendas, is that we will see a regime-led, poorly funded, politically motivated strategy of reconstruction which will privilege those who ex demonstrated their loyalty to the regime, penalize those the regime identifies as opponents, build a process of reconstruction which is unequal, not participatory, not transparent, not accountable, and which is more likely than not to lead us to a down a path in which Syria will experience neither stability, nor economic recovery, nor social recovery. Thank you, Stephen. Unfortunately, I tend to agree. I think this is the path we seem to be. Yeah, I think this is the path we seem to be wa uh, walking down because even today, I mean, for the Western countries to intervene in terms of reconstruction in Syria, it's un unless they do it on the terms of the regime, which means reinforcing regime legitimacy and regime power on the ground, it simply isn't going to happen. So the, the, um, the, the, the window, I'm not sure that it's a window of opportunity in that sense. Uh, it may just be a window of opportunity in our minds more than anything else, quite honestly. Uh, Jacqueline, let me turn to you and ask you about uh, Iraq, moving from Syria to Iraq. And if you could maybe speak, um, we were, you were telling us a bit uh, earlier, um, speak a little bit to the intersection between the various levels of reconciliation and the question of establishing security in a place like Iraq and in a post-conflict context uh, where all of this is being built as part of the moment of reconstruction. And here I think we start getting at maybe the different layers of re reconstruction and what we mean by them uh, and what comes first or second. Right. Um, this is on, right? Yeah. So I wanted to think about this through the prism of ID internally displaced persons and Iraqis that are returning to areas that have been affected by the recent um, violence and military campaign associated with uh, ISIS or Daesh. I don't know what the, you know, these terms are very political, right? If you use the wrong word or the wrong acronym, uh, you can be judged. Um, so I'm not sure what Carnegie's, perhaps ISIS, is that what I, in Iraq you must say Daesh, otherwise the government will comment to you that you've used the wrong term, for example. You don't really have institutional lines here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just so long as you don't say Islamic State, period. You right. can say the so-called. <laughs> right, right. Um, so about 3.2 million IDPs have returned, and there's about 2.6 million that are still displaced, predominantly in Nineveh, Anbar, and Salahuddin. So these are the, also the governorates that were affected the most um, by ISIS. Um, what we know from quite widespread you know, interviews and surveys is that the number one reason that people are not returning is security. Um, and that's even you know, significantly above property and lack of services and infrastructure damage, um, all of which are extreme. Um, and yet security is the, really the number one concern. And the way that people define security is not just that they're afraid of um, ISIS attacks again, it often is that they're afraid of revenge attacks if they were um, part of the community that was perceived to have supported um, ISIS. Or it could be that they don't trust the security actors that are in that area, particularly uh, as the military campaign has gone ahead. Often it was, for example, Kurdish forces taking over Arab areas or PMF Shia forces taking over Sunni areas and the relationship is not always um, good. Um, or also it might be that they just simply don't trust the security actors to assure them of security. Um, not because of discrimination, but perhaps just a lack of trust. So for me, this is really where reconciliation and security, um, they really link and it affects a, a very large number of people. Unlike something like trials or truth commissions, these you know, very public um, mechanisms, what I wanted to talk about today was the way that security vetting and also the negotiated return of IDPs through tribal mechanisms um, intersects reconciliation and security. Um, so security vetting, um, in Iraq, Generally speaking, whole communities were displaced, if not by ISIS, many people stayed, but then when the military campaign showed up, um, there was very large scale displacement. In order to return, people have to receive security clearance. Um, the mechanism that is used is, um, it's a government led uh, operation the, uh, from the operations command center at the governorate level, but it's a conglomeration of security actors that are present in that governorate. 
Um, so that includes state actors, the army, the police, um, Ministry of Interior, etc. But then it also includes non-state or quasi-state actors, um, such as the PMF, such as tribal forces that are active in the area, such as the Peshmerga um, in the north. Um, so the issue with vetting is that it, there's a lot of weight put on this mechanism because in order for people to return, they need to trust that it is vetting out people that could be a threat to the community in future. People that are vetted out um, should go through a process, they're referred to Baghdad and then should go through courts. No doubt you're aware that this process has been heavily criticised for lack of due process. Um, the other criticism is that the vetting process itself is highly opaque. Uh, it's not clear how someone is marked as an ISIS affiliate and there have been reports that up to a fourth generation of relative is encapsulated. So, um, for example, if my great uncle or my first cousin joined ISIS, then I'm part of this um, kind of blacklist of people. Um, not consistently, but this is, I guess this is part of the point that it's not a consistent um, process. Um, what complicates this and what links it back to reconciliation is that in many of these areas, the security actors that are involved are not of the same ethno-sectarian background as the IDPs. And in Iraq these days, um, after the history, um, there's a very fast uh, kind of reaction to uh, sectarian identity. And so um, there's been both a good and a bad um, kind of output from this um, vetting process. So there are some areas where, for example, in Salahuddin, there are some Sunni tribal forces that have aligned with Shia PMF forces and are trained by them, they're supported by them. Um, they are relatively, you know, there's a relatively good relationship, for example. There are many other areas, however, where um, the Shia PMF are seen as discriminating against the Sunni community, are accused of, you know, committing abuses, and in this case, it um, often fractures the community. So the vetting mechanism, I think, is, and because it affects so many people, every IDP has to go through this, um, it really is key to the way that uh, reconciliation and security are perceived. So I think it also has the potential to either contribute to um, this emerging Iraqi nationalism that a lot of people talk about, um, and this idea that people are able, in some circumstances, to see beyond uh, the kind of ethno-religious identity as being the defining character characteristic as to whether that person will protect you or treat you fairly. Uh, and then there are other instances where it's exacerbated the feeling that um, this is the defining um, factor that will decide if I'm safe or not or how I'm treated by a security actor. Um, and I think it's important to remember both. That it's a very you know, complex and nuanced. It's, it's certainly not you know, one side against the other, which I think is uh, often the way that it's portrayed. Uh, and then the second mechanism that has also um, arisen in this like um, reconciliation and security nexus uh, is tribal negotiation. So in Iraq, um, there has always been this um, almost like a negotiated dance between the state and tribes. So when the state is weak, generally speaking, tribes have been stronger. Um, and they have been, um, in 2006 and 7, for example, they were often credited with reconciliation of um, sectarian violence to avoid uh, kind of continued uh, revenge uh, killings. And in the post-ISIS um, context as well, uh, people, I guess the state has been quite overwhelmed, <coughs> security actors have been overwhelmed. Uh, there has been kind of a resurgence of people turning to these actors, um, especially when it came to uh, negotiating IDP returns. So uh, in the case of Kirkuk and also in Tikrit, um, tribal actors were able to negotiate for the uh, return of populations that had been perceived to have supported ISIS and that there was um, significant concern that had they just returned on their own, they would have been heavily attacked by people that were obviously extremely angry about what had happened in the past. Um, and to be clear, it doesn't mean that all of these people had, um, or perhaps even any of them, had committed crimes under ISIS. It's very much a perception of collective guilt and then often collective punishment um, is um, kind of enforced. Um, and so in, in both cases, Kirkuk and um, Tikrit, there was this um, negotiated return um, that was agreed. And then what's also very interesting is that um, some of these tribal leaders have said, uh, it's not our role to take on criminal justice. This is a matter for the state. And so they've agreed to refer, um, you know, if there is um, accusations of people having committed crimes under ISIS, they refer it to the state because they want to, 
um, kind of keep their identity as actors for reconciliation. And they saw that it was a conflict of interest if they're the ones that are enforcing judgment and punishment in the community. Um, that that would, that would compromise their ability as reconciliation actors. It's not the case across Iraq, but um, it's just one example of where uh, I guess that people are being very thoughtful and seeking new ways um, for social relationships to be remade that both involve the state and then also involve these very kind of localised mechanisms. Um, so perhaps my final, my concluding thought is that it's a highly fractured um, process and it really is different you know, not just at the governorate level, but even at the, the checkpoint or the, you know, the town or village level. Um, and there's really a lot of potential in these everyday, you know, vetting or uh, the way that um, people suspected of ISIS crimes are dealt with. Um, it could lead to a greater Iraqi nationalism if handled well. But if it's not, if these kind of processes are not transparent, if people don't trust them, uh, or if collective punishment is handed out, then it will risk exacerbating the kind of existing divisions um, that exist. Thanks. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, actually, it's very interesting, particularly this issue that you're talking about in terms of the localization of some of these mechanisms, I and mean, some of them are state-led, but bringing out the nuances between how at the local level and these issues, I mean, things like security, like reconciliation are then addressed and the local mechanisms that can come into play to mitigate uh, potential fallout or to rebuild. I think it's, it's quite a critical uh, uh, angle at which to look at reconciliation and reconstruction, which then brings me now to Dylan and Nineveh. To, we're staying in Iraq. Um, you know, building on what Jacqueline has talked about, maybe you can uh, elaborate a little bit more about what reconstruction means for a place like the Nineveh Valley, a place that was uh, perhaps the last bastion of uh, a plural uh, society, ethnic uh, and sectarian mix in uh, Iraq, and that has been devastated uh, and traumatized by uh, the advent of ISIS uh, by, I mean, everything that has followed since then, uh, and where we find people today very reluctant uh, to go back, where there are demands for uh, anything from secession to the creation of an, a semi-independent province, 222. Um, could you perhaps please elaborate on what reconstruction means in a context that is as volatile uh, and as traumatized as the one in the Nineveh Valley. Thank you, Mohan. Thank you for having us here at Carnegie, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I suppose I'm not only going to follow on from Jackie, but also from what Steve has said, because you know I think there are a lot of similarities on how, on how you're talking about what the state wants for reconstruction and what, what local actors may want. Um, I suppose the difference is that um, in Iraq we have a, we have a clear victory for the state, and, and you know, and I think that that is an important uh, point when you're looking at who defines reconstruction. Uh, what is reconstruction? It's a it's a very important question and something that we have been debating today, um, and I think it's this is important in the sense of. Uh, Nineveh particularly because of the plural nature of how, of how you're talking about it and and who decides what reconstruction is um, when you're talking also like I mean I, I have quite a broad definition of reconstruction and I, th I think it you know it's not just the physical reconstruction we're talking about the uh, political level the societal level um, and so on so then when you're talking about reconstruction we I mean some people think of reconstruction as as going back in a sense and reconstructing and, and I think that's a very important thing to when you're talking about Nineveh that's not what you're looking to do you do not want to reconstruct what was in Nineveh uh, pre-2014 and, and I mean when you think about it as early as uh, 2013 even 2011 maybe so if you're going back on that level I mean then we, there's a number of issues when we, we're talking about security um, at a political level uh, we're talking about the disputed territories in, in Nineveh where there is a competition for power which has been ongoing since 2003 um, and you don't want to go back this is not the reconstruction that we're trying to go at we're not trying to to go to the issues that 
some would argue led to the rise of, of the Islamic State or to be a so-called Islamic State. If that's, um, so that's not the reconstruction you want. You do not want to re-bring or bring back the same issues that, that led to the events in 2014. And with, we're talking particularly with, with regards to security and governance um, and society relations. I mean, if, you, if you're looking at Mosul uh, as, as a, a window to examine um, how society operates in Iraq, there was a lot of um, a lot of minorities were pushed out of the uh, out of the city, and they went to the Kurdish region. Um, there were a lot of actors who who thought that they no longer had a place in there, and th and that's the point I'm trying to make. This is not reconstruction, so as as I would like to define it. So then, if we're thinking about okay, what is reconstruction? Which then I suppose the construction part is the important part. So we're trying to look towards the future, and then you have the dynamics, and we have the we have the. Baghdad government, we have the Nineveh Provincial Council, and we have Erbil in the Kurdish region. And they all have their own idea of what they see reconstruction as, or you know, what they would like to see. So we're going to, I suppose, the security and um, to start off with. And if you speak to the Nineveh Provincial Council, they really want to have control of their own security. Um, they do not like the presence of, of the Hushts that are connected, I suppose, not to the region. So the Hushts that are, are very much, they seen as, as Baghdad based or, or even connected to external actors. What they want is they want control of security on a local level. And they would like to move towards, towards having some sort of uh, control within an Iraqi state. They're not looking, you know, to, to I suppose, um, divert from the traditions of the state, but they want some sort of control. And then if you go to governance um, for, for the next level, I mean, governance, again, if you speak to the Nineveh Provincial Council, what they would like is, um, I mean, they would like, obviously, more power. I mean, that, that, that if we, when you're talking about power, um, it, it can be quite dangerous when people are asking for more power. But in the, if you're looking at the dynamics of pre-2014 uh, Nineveh, then you look at the issues with the centralization in Iraq and um, the loss of power, uh, particularly, I mean, going back to the security of, of the military and how the military changed. Um, rather than see, being seen as a local actor, it became very much seen as uh, Maliki, linked actor and you know if we speak to individuals on the ground they talk about stories about how their shops were robbed by the army how they had to pay bribes how they you know so this was this is the vision that they have of the iraqi army um, which they don't want to go back to so then you go to the the language of i suppose victory against the islamic state and and this is when when people i mean now they're starting to see a different iraqi army and now people are starting to actually have some sort of a sense of civic nationalism. Uh, there's some sort of Iraqi unity, and I think this is a very important window, which when you're, def when you're talking about reconstruction in Nineveh, this is where the point where you must begin. You, where you're talking about um, people having a sense of, of, of Iraqiness, people who, who didn't for a long time, having a sense of civic nationalism, that is where, for me, reconstruction must begin. You have to take advantage of this moment. And now we're at that window where we go one way or the other way. And I think the elections in, uh, hopefully in May, uh, this is where the decisions are made about what, what, what happens to Iraq, what, what happens to Nineveh. Um, so, I mean, I, if those of you who are following Iraqi politics, there's lots of differences um, with who's gonna align with who, and so, we, you know, and changes of alliances. But I think with regards to Nineveh, um, if, if um, certain politicians win the, who promised decentralization. I think this is when we start seeing what reconstruction in Nineveh is going to happen. Because at the moment it's at pause. You know, it's you know we have physical reconstruction which is NGO led, but with regards to the broader idea of how we were trying to define reconstruction, there is at a pause, and we're waiting till what's going to happen post elections. Um, and that's where I want to go back to that main point: is, is civic nationalism. Uh, you know, we have to take advantage of, of what happened, um, the defeat of the Islamic State. We have to take advantage of, of people seeing the Iraqi army coming in and, and even the, the, the Hushts, seeing them coming in as liberators. And if you begin at that point, then you can really define reconstruction as something that is going to, to turn Nineveh towards back to being a pluralist society, back to um, being Iraqi, but also having some sort of local autonomy and some sort of control where people feel that you know they are part of the state, but they also have you know local local governance. I think that's a good point. Just to leave it there with civic nationalism being the the last phrase.
Thank you. Thank you, Dylan, for actually bringing back this idea of maybe civicness as part and parcel of uh, any kind of post reconstruction uh, discussion. Uh, and it's something that we often um, sort of, the, the idea of also how do you mediate between the local and the central levels. Um, Mark, let me turn finally to you and perhaps you can broaden the discussion a little bit uh, to go beyond Lebanon, Syria and Iraq and see what are the issues that, the questions that we've put on the table raise for a broader Arab world in that sense. Well, well, thanks, Maha. And yeah, I, I think it's extremely important. I think what we saw with the Arab uprisings and how they spread and the diffusion of conflict out of Syria or out of Libya is that none of these conflicts will stay uh, contained within a particular state. These are, def these are genuinely region-wide problems which will have to be dealt with at a, at a, at a region-wide uh, level. And I, I think that one of the key things we have to start with is we have to recognize that these conflicts are not going to end anytime soon. We talk about post-conflict uh, uh, reconstruction, but um, the conflicts won't end. The wars might end in a formal sense, but uh, we're, we should expect that whether it not just in uh, Syria and Iraq, but also in Libya and Yemen and the Sinai and uh, Palestine, uh, kind of across the region, uh, we're going to be seeing these wars continuing in some form or another for quite some time. And so aid will flow. There will be new forms of humanitarian assistance and development assistance, but I think it's actually quite important to understand that this assistance will go into ongoing conflicts and will inevitably have political effects uh, within those conflicts, which uh, in no sense will be neutral. I think that uh, many of us think about that aid as coming from regional powers. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But I'd also like to emphasize the way that post-conflict or in-conflict reconstruction efforts uh, have really gone a long way to embedding uh, non-governmental organizations and, and foreign actors within the essential nature of states around the entire Middle East. It's almost impossible to even conceive of an Iraqi state right now without the hundreds of humanitarian organizations who are providing the essential services for their citizens. Uh, same thing in the rebel-controlled parts of Syria. The more that you see NGOs providing this essential assistance, the more that they become deeply embedded in the structure of those states. You think of a, a country like Jordan, which uh, effectively offloads a significant portion of its sovereignty to the NGOs who provide the services and uh, the governance to uh, the, popula the refugee populations that, uh, that, that are present. And so I think that's an important part to keep in mind. Um, I think that a, a second point that I wanted to make is that I think we, even though we talk about it all the time, I can only speak for myself and for the people I engage with, but I think that we collectively still have a hard time coming to grips with the, with the scale and the magnitude of the destructive effects of these wars and political failures on the region. I mean, the refugees, obviously, but I, I can't get over trying to, trying to conceptualize the effects of an entire generation that have known nothing but war, failed states, destruction, hatred, murder, the shattering of communities. And you start trying to imagine what reconstruction will mean with these kinds of shattered generations. And it's very difficult to, uh, to, to predict that in any kind of linear fashion. I don't think we can automatically assume that those generations will be inclined towards a social behavior or violence. They might end up becoming the most dedicated citizens determined to restore civil life um, it, it's possible, but I think we need to be thinking about this in genuinely generational terms. What is, what is the region going to look like in 10, 20 years when these kids uh, form the backbone of, the, of the, this rising productive uh, 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 part of society? And it's difficult to, to conceptualize. Institutionally, when you start looking at places like Libya or Yemen, uh, or for that matter, Syria, Iraq, 
Uh, the sheer scale of the, of the physical destruction of infrastructure and of the destruction of human infrastructure is something which uh, is going to pose really, I think, unique uh, uh, burdens on reconstruction because you're going to begin, be beginning from something which is a, almost complete devastation in many areas. Um, and so that, that's something which has to be brought into, um, brought into consideration. And then there's the widespread delegitimation of all forms of peaceful policy politics and of peaceful political change. In no country in the Middle East have the grievances which drove the Arab uprisings been resolved. In almost every case, those grievances are now worse and more intense. Every regime in the Middle East is more unstable today than it was 10 years ago. And yet, thanks to things like the military coup in Egypt and the restoration of authoritarianism everywhere, uh, the idea of peaceful political change has been almost completely discredited. And so there's, I think we have to assume that in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see enormous new waves of political contention and disruption, um, which any reconstruction efforts will be affected by. Um, and yet there, there are virtually no political channels remaining by which to address those grievances. And so if I were an investor looking to make money in reconstruction, I would say the Middle East is a huge market, but not one I'd want to be involved with. Um, the last point I want to make then, then follows directly from that. Who is going to be providing all of this uh, reconstruction assistance, which is so desperately needed? Uh, don't look at the United States. Uh, we live in Washington. Um, Trump's not giving you any money. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's America first now. Um, Obama wasn't giving any money either because the United States doesn't have any money. Um, and there's not going to be any significant U.S. investment in the reconstruction of Arab countries. There's not going to be any particularly significant European investment because they also have no money. Um, where is the money? It's in Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and United Arab Emirates, all of whom are active partisans in all of the wars. In fact, they are in many cases both proximate causes and ongoing intensifiers of those wars. There is zero chance that any aid given by those three countries will be politically neutral uh, and I would extend that to Iran or Turkey. And so this will go into the intensification of political conflict, not into any meaningful reconstruction. And so where is the money going to come from? The United Nations? No. Europe? No. Well, thank you. I think that the, only, the most likely um, source of any kind of meaningful rec uh, new financing for reconstruction is going to come out of China and East Asia, uh, which historically has not been interested in providing such assistance, and yet things are changing. The U.S. role in the region and in the world is receding. Uh, the interest in energy in the Middle East for China and the rest of the East Asian powers is growing, and I think that uh, you know if you look at the One Belt One Road initiative, you look at Chinese investment. In, uh, in and interests in both the energy of the Gulf and in the markets of Africa, it seems to me almost inevitable that you're going to see increased Chinese role and in a continuing way. But what will that mean for, for reconstruction, which is completely divorced from the, the kind of the liberal norms of political reconstruction, which have typically informed Western development and UN-led development organizations. I don't know, but I think that as we're trying to project what the future of the Middle East will look like in terms of reconstruction, it seems to me these are the interesting and important questions to be asking. Thank you, Mark. I think on this note, rather than comment, I'll open it up for, uh, for questions from the audience. If, uh, there's a mic. If you, I could ask each of you to introduce yourselves and just and just to give everybody space. If you could just limit it to a question. Yes, sure. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and thank you for the <clears throat> for this panel. Okay, I'm Fisama Clayt, a doctoral candidate at the Geneva School of Diplomacy and International Relations. My question is, what about the Kurdish question? Thank you. Okay. We'll take a round and then, yeah. 
Hi, my name is Mona Alami. I'm an unresident fellow with Atlantic Council. My question is uh, to Professor Heidman. Uh, you very briefly spoke about Iran. Um, I wanted you to comment about recent news emerging from Syria. Uh, as you may, my, you may know, uh, Iran is uh, promoting more the local defense forces and integrating Shiite militias that are pro-Iranian into these local defense forces. And uh, news are emerging that in the Aleppo region, these LDF, new, uh, these LDF elements, non-state armed actors, are actively involved in reconstruction, electricity, uh, rebuilding and that you know makes me ponder is it you know is Iran using the same example just with Hezbollah after the the se several Israeli aggressions to Lebanon by uh, extending a reconstruction arm to this non-state armed actors so can you comment about the LDF involvement in such a project thanks okay we can start with that Question, sorry. Um, where? Uh, how, what I mean by the Kurdish question here, we talk about reconstruction, we can reconstruct physically, but uh, regarding the society, the community, and uh, politics, how can we reconstruct and still the Kurdish question is unresolved? I mean, I'm going to, there's many Kurdish questions, so that's what I was more getting at. So I'll, I'll just go the one that I know the most is in Iraq. Um, so the Kurdish question in Iraq, I mean, I think the recent events where you have um, the Iraqi forces retaking uh, Kukuk, retaking control of many, um, many important oil wells, re retaking many parts of the Nineveh uh, plains, the, the disputed territories there. Um, and now closing down the airports and borders. So now we have a, reass a reassertment of, of, I suppose, Baghdad control. And this is very important for, I suppose, not maybe not for the Kurdish question, but for Iraq as a whole. Because now for the first time, uh, federalism does not become a dirty word. Because in Iraq, federalism is something you, you don't talk about. And um, now with the, I suppose, the changing dynamics where there is, I suppose, a limit to power, People who, who asked for federalism before, whether it whether they're in uh, Nineveh, in uh, Basra, now the the recon, I suppose the redefining of what federalism is is Iraq, which is a process which is currently going in, um, has important repercussions for for governance at at a country level, um, and and it and it allows for the decentralization which we have been talking about, which Abadi has been talking about, which you know Sistani has been talking about. Now for the first time, it actually becomes a possibility because you do not have this threat of a successionist federal region uh, coming into play, purely down to the dynamics of change that has happened um, with the re retaking of power and control of important parts. Um, but that's just from a, one of the many, many Kurdish questions. Does anyone else want to respond to this? Or maybe we can move on to Stephen? No, it's, it's been very interesting to watch Iran deploy its presence in Syria to support uh, its own reconstruction agenda, uh, an agenda which, at least in part, I think, is linked to ensuring that um, Iran has the capacity to reward loyalists or, or others who were brought to Iran to participate, I mean to Iraq, to Syria, to participate in the conflict with the expectation that at the end of the day they would receive some recognition or some compensation or some benefit as a result of their service. And, and we're ab absolutely seeing uh, instances in which conscript labor is in effect being deployed um, toward, toward that end. And, and I, think, I think what we're seeing here is a very interesting, um, uh, is, is a very interesting case in which by inserting itself directly into reconstruction processes, um, just as, as you suggested, it's also in some respects taking the lead in configuring elements of security forces that will respond to the authority of Iranian commanders as opposed to Syrian or other commanders. Iran is equipping itself with the capacity to manage its own reconstruction priorities and its own broader long-term political uh, and economic uh, priorities in Syria in a way that contains and limits uh, 
uh, the, the authority of the Assad regime to affect how those processes un unfold. That's very interesting. A at the moment, it isn't at all clear that the Assad regime has the capacity to push back against those inroads into what would otherwise be considered the sovereign authority of a national government. It isn't at all clear at the moment that the Assad regime actually views it as important to try to I impose itself on these processes in, a ways that would, in, a, in ways that would establish its authority over the Iranians. But I can see the moment at which it would wish to do so. I can see the moment at which these infringements by Iran on the sovereignty of the Assad regime will become an embarrassment, will become uh, a, a source of tension in the relationship, will become a source of tension between local communities who feel themselves being pushed aside as Iranian actors and their, 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 their loyalists consolidate their control over certain sectors of the Syrian economy or bits and pieces of the Syrian economy. So while I imagine that this is a process in which Iran feels it is moving quickly to try and put itself in a position in which it will be difficult to roll back some of the gains that it's now enjoying, I suspect that these, these um, initiatives on the part of Iran may not be quite as sustainable as the Iranians think and could actually introduce new axes of tension into the relationship between Iran and the Assad regime, um, which, uh, which would be very, very interesting to watch and which, frankly, I think are one of the concerns that we need to have on our own radar as issues that are likely to arise more broadly over the coming years um, once, once regime authority does become more fully consolidated, its dependence on, on Iran diminishes. Uh, perhaps its annoyance at having to defer to Iran increases. So I can see this as, as a space in which the, uh, the, the approach Iran is taking now could in some respects backfire against it in the longer term. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, more questions? Bashar? Question. It seems to me, maybe I misunderstood uh, you, kind of preparing the ground for uh, engagement in rebuilding, whether the West is willing to engage in rebuilding or not. You were suggesting that they should be, because otherwise the regime will take over and the regime will do a messier job than uh, uh, the, the one under some kind of conditionality with the West. And I think that kind of premise is doubtful because what will happen is that, you know, the regime will not give up sovereignty, of course, will not give up uh, uh, authority. Will, you will have your stuff on the ground. You will not be able to monitor the details. The regime will threaten your employees, will control all the all the rebuilding effort and ends up, what emerges is that you end up paying the bill for the destruction done by the regime and its allies. Uh, what is the, mor the moral cost is very high. It's like assuming the Nazi regime was, did not collapse but shrunk to uh, your beneficial Germany. Uh, and then you end up doing a Marshall Plan for the Nazi regime uh, in the hope that if they do it themselves, it will be much worse and you have no control on the ground. It's basically, you are, in some sense, if I understood you rightly, maybe I understood you wrongly, you are, by, by painting the picture that better than letting the regime do it, even the regime cannot do it actually, doesn't have the money to do it. The moral cost is high, the opportunity when the regime fails for its own base, which provided the blood and the, uh, and the, and the effort to start questioning the regime, you know, after, uh, if, when it fails to reconstruct, we want our, you know, payback, about booty, whatever it is. I think that the possibilities for a change within the regime base, when they don't see the money rolling, is much higher. The moral uh, cost of paying such criminal regime, the bill for the destruction, is, is very high, and the opportunities for changing it is really very low. I don't see the argument for any argument for engaging 
in the rebuilding effort, uh, rather than engaging in improving the condition of the refugees wherever they are. Just take a couple more questions first. Okay, there's a question here and the question in the back. Hello, uh, Ala, Syrian, studying urbanism in Lisbon. My question is, when we are talking about Syria, are we talking about the same territory with the same borders for the next 20 years, with the existing of the Turkish interests in the north and the Kurdish issue, and the Iranian interest in the south, and the existing of Israel and all these issues that related to Middle East? Do you think we are going to see two strategies of urbanism in two sides, or this is far from what we imagine? Thank, Thank you. you. There's a question in the back, the gentleman with the purple. Thank you. Um, Joseph Halu, adjunct faculty at the Lebanese American University. Um, I thank you firstly for all your, uh, your opinions and uh, your very, very intellectual interventions on the topic, but I have a question for Professor Lynch. I personally have read uh, two of your books and publications in the past uh, couple of years, The Arab Uprisings, uh, The Additive Volume, and then uh, The Arab Wars. And to see that um, you speak of intervention, external inf intervention, playing a major role in uh, the Arab uprisings and in uh, the Middle East in particular. Now, uh, according to international relations and the way we see you know, intervention, we all know that at one point actors intervene in states because they want something out of it. So, uh, seeing, considering that, because uh, you, you, just, you just mentioned that the U.S., you see the U.S. receding from uh, the region and intervening less so in Syria and in the Middle East in the, next, in the few coming years. But some facts on the ground, such as the uh, reconstruction of a massive U.S. embassy in Lebanon, uh, the ability and the availability of more than supposedly 10 U uh, American bases in Syria right now, keeping in mind that they do have, uh, the Americans also have bases in Iraq and around the region, Qatar and so on. So with that massive deployment of uh, American resources, U.S. resources, troops, uh, intellectual capacity, uh, planning and so on, what, uh, in your opinion, does the U.S. want out of Syria in the future? Because even in the, I mean, they don't have to pay or invest, but you, you don't have to pay to want something out of it, right? So, in your opinion, what does the U.S. want in the post-reconstruction uh, phase? Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to start taking sure. this? And, and, and I'll try to be, be um, relatively concise. I, I don't think you and I disagree that much, in fact. I, I, I share the view that there are significant moral costs for the West attached to participation for in reconstruction of post-conflict Syria. Um, I, I tend to agree as well that I think the regime is absolutely unwilling to concede any elements of sovereignty in terms of the oversight and management of reconstruction processes. And, and this is part of what would um, pr generate these, these costs that would be borne by external actors, the West, the EU, if they were to, to uh, agree to provide support for reconstruction uh, on terms defined by the regime. Uh, as to whether or not the outcome would be worse, I, I'll, I'll take the risk of interpreting what you said to mean that the likely beneficiaries of reconstruction would be more narrowly defined to regime loyalists that there are strong possibilities that funding for reconstruction would flow more heavily to those areas that exhibited loyalty to the regime and so on and so forth. Uh, I agree with that as well. And that's why I think it is very important for the West to be explicit and clear about the criteria the regime would need to meet before it would be prepared to provide support for reconstruction, 
and that if it cannot be assured that those criteria will be met, and I don't mean just met on paper, I mean met in the process of the implementation of reconstruction programs, then the US, the EU, the World Bank, and other donors should be prepared to walk away. That's, that's my view. Uh, and, and I don't think that means that reconstruction will not happen. I think it means it will happen on a very different timetable with a very different um, with, with, with a very different kind of um, uh, organization in terms of where resources go and so on, uh, who benefits and, and otherwise, as I mentioned earlier. So in some ways, what I heard you say seems to, to align pretty closely with the position that I, that I tried to express. And if I, if I didn't make that clear, then, then I apologize. What is Syria going to look like in a few years? You know, who, 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 what, what can we anticipate in terms of control over territory, in terms of the scope of authority that the Assad regime will enjoy? Um, I, I think we have to recognize that conflict has produced significant obstacles to the reconsolidation of Assad regime authority over all of pre-2011 Syria. Nonetheless, well, let me back up, not, not just has posed significant obstacles, but has created enormous variation in the conditions that exist in various regions of Syria. So that we have a number of different categories of, of, of territory that the regime is going to have to figure out how to deal with. We have loyalist areas, we have areas that were uh, under the control of the opposition, but where local populations may not have been as actively involved in the uprising as in areas where uh, the territory was not only controlled by opposition groups, but the population was sympathetic to the uprising. And we have the areas that were under the control of ISIS and so on. And I have a very strong feeling that the regime will approach processes of reconstruction with a very keen awareness of these differences across different territorial spaces in Syria. So that significant levels of reconstruction funds will flow to areas inhabited by loyalists. Some support may be available to areas held by the opposition where populations were largely uh, quiescent during the course of the uprising. I'm pretty firmly persuaded that some territory will be treated in a punitive fashion by the Assad regime uh, because it is associated in the regime's mind with the opposition. We have the ISIS area, and that will pose a different set of challenges. So we can't minimize this variation. But having said that, my expectation is that within the near term, I don't know what that means, not a year, but three years, four years, five years, the Assad regime will have extended its authority across all of pre-2011 Syria, uh, including in the Northeast, including in the South, and including in the areas to the east of the Euphrates. Now that's a long conversation, we can, we can go into that, but I think we see we see how the, the, um, the specific concerns that are present in each of those different areas all have solutions that rest on negotiated bargains, negotiated compromise, and the construction of coalitions that provide opportunities for the regime to extend their authorities into those areas. Look at the Northeast as an example. Uh, I, I don't see that there are significant obstacles to the conclusion of some kind of an understanding between the PYD and the regime. And initially that may provide for significant autonomy on the part of the PYD. I also firmly expect, as, as Henry Kissinger's great advice uh, to uh, American negotiators emphasized, sign the agreement now, erode it later. I firmly expect that any agreement signed by the regime will not be honored in the long term and that to the extent uh, the PYD zones are brought back under the nominal authority of the state sooner with 
significant local control for, for Kurdish actors. In 10 years, that local control will have been largely chipped away at and, and, and will disappear. So, so my own projection, I, I, I'm, I'm congenitally pessimistic about these things, so you have to understand that, but, but, but my own prediction is, is that recognizing how unsettled many of these spaces are today, um, the trends, in my mind, really point to the slow, incremental, but persistent expansion of regime authority over Syrian territory. Thank you, Steve, on that very optimistic note. <laughs> um, if I can just add one thing before we move to Mark, I think one thing that we're not talking about is um, the, the, the stage that supposedly precedes reconstruction, which is stabilization. And what we're seeing today, I mean, stabilization is now being used uh, in, almost interchangeably with reconstruction. But we're, what we're seeing today is a stabilization in the image of Russia in many ways. We're talking about stabilization that is about uh, reconsolidating authoritarian regimes about uh, maintaining a kind of a level of just a top-down approach where um, you know you pacify certain regions you let others basically rot in hell until you have a measure to to work with them which is very much what you're describing in many ways but this is kind of the the move that we're we're, we're going into at least in the near future unless something really kind of changes dramatically uh, beyond that Mark, if you want to. Great, yeah, thanks. And, um, and, and uh, sir, thank, thank you for reading my books. Uh, that's a fine, you're a role model for everyone and every, that everyone should imitate. Uh, <laughs> Um, it's an excellent question. I, I, I did not mean to suggest that the U.S. is uh, withdrawing from the Middle East or fleeing from the Middle East completely. That's, that's not the case. Um, but I do think that there's a, a, a long trend uh, which will continue of the U.S. as scaling back its, uh, its aspirations in the region. And uh, I would say that at this point, the, um, the definition of American interests in the Middle East and the, the strategy that we have, such as it is, essentially boils down to counterterrorism and counter-Iranism. And that's basically it. Um, the, the talk that we once heard uh, during the Bush administration of, of transforming the region through spreading freedom and through invading Iraq and all those things, I think that it's not just Trump. I think that uh, a significant portion uh, of, of the foreign policy community, uh, from Obama to Trump, is essentially allergic to large-scale military intervention in the Middle East. In my view, that's a very good thing. And um, I think what this means is that you see aspirations to do these much more limited things as cheaply as possible with as little enduring uh, uh, commitment as possible. So the Trump administration on Syria, the, its grand military initiative was one airstrike, uh, a missile barrage against one airfield with absolutely no follow-up, um, and it changed nothing. I think that's the sort of military action that, that you're likely to see. ISIS was different. The counter-ISIS campaign is largely concluded, or at least that's what we've decided collectively as a, a national security establishment. And the Trump administration is desperately looking for anybody to hand over uh, those territories to. Uh, they prefer that it was the, the SDF or the, the which, with YPG, if we want to call it that. Um, but if it's the regime, that will probably do. Um, that, uh, as far as they're concerned, as long because they because they don't want to be bogged down there. But at the same time, they want to confront Iran in theaters where it's possible to do so. And I actually think that for a significant portion of, of the American uh, of the United States that supported involvement in Syria from the beginning, it was primarily about confronting Iran and making an Iranian ally pay a price. And I think that will continue. Uh, the, so I imagine to see. I would expect to see more destabilizing, more destabilization efforts of regime-controlled areas, but not American direct military involvement. Um, and you'll see counter-Iranian activities in Yemen, in uh, and uh, hopefully not in Lebanon, 
Um, and then the continuing attempt at all costs to avoid the obvious hole in this entire strategy, which is Iraq, where we are deeply and profoundly committed to the survival and stability of an Iranian-dominated Iraqi government, which we have trained, equipped, and politically supported at great cost. And so I think that incoherence in U.S. grand strategy will continue for the foreseeable future, um, but I, but I, I think that um, it could be at a, uh, a slightly higher level of military engagement. It could be at a significantly lower level of military engagement. It will not be an abandonment of the region, and I think the odds of a significant escalation of U.S. involvement are also um, relatively low. Although, with this administration, I, uh, I, have zero, I have less confidence that something like a war with Iran wouldn't like, come out of miscalculation or uh, poorly understood strategy. It's, it's possible, but I think unlikely, because um, I think that at this point, at least, uh, we're more likely to see that accidental war with North Korea than, uh, than with Iran. But, but I think that, generally speaking, the US posture in the region is one at a, at a significantly lower uh, level than what certainly the, the Clinton administration in the 90s or the Bush administration up until roughly 2006 uh, envisioned uh, for the US in the region. And um, I think that uh, other great powers will take advantage of that because um, you know, that's kind of the way international relations works. Um, if I were a Chinese strategist, I would be committing malpractice if I continued to uh, subcontract out and free ride on US military hegemony in the Middle East because you can't count on that anymore. And if I'm Russia, I know that I can't possibly be a hegemonic power in the Middle East, but I can certainly cause trouble for the United States and I can sell a lot of bad weapon systems um, and that's enough. Um, and that's how I would roughly see the, the future of great power politics in the region. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Oh, okay, three. Just, just keep, please keep it very brief. Let's start here. Um, it always just, happens. Uh, <laughs> it is a question for both Professor Lynch and uh, Professor Heidman. Uh, you said, uh, I mean, about uh, funding for the reconstruction in Syria. It won't come from the U.S., from nor the EU or. Uh, any Western, the World Bank, or any Western uh, establishment, uh, and it might come, well, probably, it could come from Iran and China. Well, I mean, how, how much Iran can sustain a reconstruction in Syria? And we know they have issues at home, economic issues, and we are seeing more sanctions or no, um, I mean, more sanctions against Iran. How much can Iran play a role in that? I mean, how big the role that Iran can play in, in reconstruction and imposing its uh, reconstruction conditions? The question, yeah. Uh, good evening. I'm uh, Philipp Herter, and I work for the International Committee of the Red Cross in Syria. Um, so, I have a, my question is about basically sort of the nexus between uh, returns, IDP retur IDPs returning, and um, and reconstruction. So, what we could see in the past month is that there's many IDP camps in the country that have been closing, that were basically uh, yeah, shut down, and there are indications that many people who have been there, they were sent to areas where they were not originally from. And so my question is, what do you think does that mean for the reconstruction of the, the society, the, the wider society in Syria, and also the stability of the, the Syrian country? Thanks. Thank you. There's a question in the back. One more over there. Uh, hi, my name is Amir Freed from the Canadian Embassy. There's a discussion going on right now in diplomatic circles, among academics, analysts, about reconstruction funds as leverage. You alluded to that as well, um, whether it's how the money is spent or having somehow shaping the contours of, of the direction the regime's going post-conflict or post-war at least. Um, to what extent 
is even significant amount of funds leveraged? What possible concessions would Assad make? Thank you. I think we'll go back. Ah. There's one more question. Okay, sorry, I didn't see that. Go on. I can't see who it well, is. Um, uh, hi there. Ah, Samer, uh, Samer hi. Jabour from the American University of Beirut. Um, uh, so, um, uh, one comment regarding another uh, um, uh, brand of um, reconstruction we're uh, hearing a lot more about, which is sectoral reconstruction in which the discussion is about a grand, uh, a grand reconstruction scheme is not possible. But uh, let us start with the um, benevolent uh, sectors, health, uh, education, this and that. And um, there's a whole range of discourses related to that, but uh, this is something that perhaps uh, I have not heard covered in the discussion. Thank you. you want to start, Steve? On Iraq and IDPs and reconciliation. I mean, it was specific to Syria, right? Maybe I can just comment that the, um, that the lesson from Iraq is that displacement is a very powerful political tool and we've seen um, not insubstantial demographic change um, take place from actors being able to either stop people returning to their homes, requiring them to return to other places, uh, or people returning and then just never receiving any reconstruction. And so they might return and then they uh, were displaced again. Uh, and that has, um, it's led to some substantial kind of political um, structural changes as well. But I, I mean, I, I won't speak about Syria and the Iraq, but I would say that it's a, in Iraq, it's a really significant concern, not just from the humanitarian angle, but from the fact that it allows competing governments or political actors to use displacement as a method of demographic change. That's right. Let me just quickly try to take these in order. You're absolutely right. None of the regime's key inter international patrons will be able to provide significant levels of funding for uh, reconstruction. And, and I, I think um, it, is, it is not reasonable to expect that, uh, that they will be able to drive any kind of reconstruction process that comes anywhere close to supporting um, an effort that is consistent with the scale of destruction or with the cost of reconstruction as it's been identified by international agencies. What's really, really important to keep in mind is that this is utterly typical of post-conflict reconstruction funding. I can't think of a single instance of post-conflict reconstruction in which the scale of external funding exceeded 5 or 10 percent of the overall reconstruction bill. This is not unusual. I think there is a very, very clear political purpose to emphasizing and constantly calling attention to a reconstruction bill estimated to be $300 billion. It's a negotiating position. It's intended to induce responses from the international community that would increase the level of support provided. But look, for instance, at South Korea after the end of the Korean War. I suspect the scale of international contributions for Korea's post-war reconstruction was no more than 5% of the total reconstruction bill. Look at Sarajevo today. Look at Bosnia walk through downtown Sarajevo, where significant reconstruction has happened. You continue to see buildings uh, that were damaged during the war that have not yet been rebuilt. Look around us. You know, look around us here. We see the same thing. So I think we have to be mindful that there is a, a long, long history of bargaining around levels of reconstruction support in which Governments in post-conflict countries always push the higher number and the international community never, never responds at that level. That, of course, has implications for how reconstruction unfolds. It will be partial, it will be incremental, it will be slow, it will be driven very heavily by small-scale local initiatives uh, rather than by large-scale externally designed reconstruction efforts. 
it will be supported by the kind of legal and regulatory changes that the Assad regime has made to um, create incentives for local investment in reconstruction, including creating incentives for the return of business actors who fled during the war to bring their capital back to the country and all of this. So we're going to see, see this piecemeal ad hoc process in which resources never, never align with needs and, and I don't think we should view that as in any sense uh, exceptional in the Syrian case. In terms of this whole issue of um, IDP returns and the political management of both refugee and IDP relocation, we have to recognize that this, in fact, is one of the most significant obstacles to the participation of Western uh, EU, US, World Bank um, uh, institutions, governments in reconstruction processes because they understand completely that part of the Assad regime's reconstruction logic is a logic of demographic change. Not ethnic cleansing in the classic sense, but of consolidating processes of reconstruction that um, change the demographic composition of neighborhoods that were viewed as principally loyal to the opposition during the war. And Meza, um, you know, areas of Meza in Damascus, areas in Homs, areas in other parts of the country in which we already see that permits for large-scale rebuilding contracts have been issued, often to regime cronies, based on legal frameworks that authorize the regime to seize ownership of properties that are considered illegal, informal, or abandoned during war. We see additional property being seized because its owners were identified as supporters of the opposition during the war, in other words, as traitors, whether, whether there's proof for those designations or not. And so, to the extent that these politically managed processes of um, of uh, political, that these processes of managing population movements to advance the longer term political agenda of the Assad regime, which is often now seen in terms of the comments that Bashar al-Assad made back in the summer about creating a more homogeneous and pure Syrian society as one of the beneficial consequences of the war. This is a huge obstacle. To, to Western participation in the, in the uh, reconstruction process. Do funds offer leverage? Well, I published an op-ed uh, with the Atlantic Council in Washington some months ago called The Illusion of Reconstruction, or The Delusion of, I forget which. But, but I, I um, am profoundly skeptical that the resource requirements of the Assad regime offer any opportunity for leverage by Western donors. And we've seen the Assad regime explicitly define terms on which it will permit Western donors to support reconstruction. There have to be apologies, there has to be an acknowledgement of their role in contributing to the destruction caused by the war. They're putting all of the, you know, that, that the regime will only award contracts to those governments that have been loyal to the regime in the course of the war. In other words, the regime itself has made clear that it is unwilling to make concessions to the West that would, that would um, support the speculation about uh, reconstruction as, as a source of leverage. And, and so from my own perspective, I, I think um, this is one area in which the EU in particular seems to have a somewhat exaggerated sense of the possibilities for leverage that reconstruction offers. And it's another reason why from my own perspective, what's critical is for Western actors to define the criteria that the regime would need to meet that would trigger a willingness to participate in reconstruction on one hand, and on the other hand, that those agencies, actors, governments are willing to walk away if those conditions are not, are not met. So I certainly don't mind uh, that, that these actors 
try to secure leverage on the basis of reconstruction. I'm just very skeptical that it's going to happen. Thank you, Stephen. Dylan, do you want to say anything before we move to Mark? Um, I think it was mainly Syria focused, but I suppose a little bit on the um, sectoral reconstruction. I think in, in Nineveh you will find this is very much um, at the moment a bottom-up movement. So, you know, we, if you look at the, the university and the library, and th this has been um, to an extent done by the local population, which is important in itself, but the reason I was not really focused on it, because it, it was really bottom-up, and, and which when you I suppose I should have mentioned then, because when, you, when you're talking about the politics and, and the old politics, this is again, I suppose, important that uh, when you look at the library, when you look at the hospital, when you look at the university, who was the first one to, to go in and rebuild it? It was the local population. Um, and then, yeah, I think most of it was on Syria, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Mark? Two brief comments uh, on the question of leverage. Um, I, I always find it uh, somewhat amusing when people will make an argument that says, let, 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 let's, let's fool Assad, we'll give him aid, and that will give us leverage over him. Now, you're not supposed to say the quiet part out loud, right? I mean, it, it basically, if I am Assad and I'm listening to this, I would say no. Of course I'm not going to give you, le your secret plan will fail. Um, there's only one way that you can leverage aid for influence, and that is if three conditions are met. If there's, a, if there's a very significant amount of aid on offer, if there is a unified international bargaining front, and if you're the only game in town, none of those conditions are met. Uh, the Americans and the Europeans are not on the same page on this, and the UN is not on the same page on this, and the international humanitarian organizations aren't on the same page. Um, the amount of money on offer is relatively small compared to the need, and there's multiple other competing possible sources of assistance. So I think there's zero, I think there's less than zero chance that that, 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 that would work, even even if, even if there were uh, other political reasons for doing it. Um, but that said, we all know how quickly things can change on a dime. And uh, we've seen uh, very dramatic changes in Saudi policy towards Syria uh, over the last year. And uh, you know, despite the fact that you've seen the Saudis demonizing Bashar al-Assad justifiably and correctly since 2011, if uh, Mohammed bin Salman decides tomorrow that he wants access and leverage in Syria, he would change his mind on a dime and the entire Saudi media would go along with him and um, we would suddenly be in a, in a different world. And so I think that's something that we have to keep in mind as we, as we straight line from where we have been to where we're going. Um, I, I would just like to, I, I think that it's entirely appropriate and it's been good that most of the conversation has been about Syria and Iraq, given the scale and magnitude of the issues there. But as a, as a way to finish this off, I do think it's worthwhile looking at Yemen. There's enormously important discussions that have to be had about the reconstruction of Yemen and whether that will take the form of trying to rebuild a unified Yemeni state or trying to focus only on particular areas. The question about sectoral uh, things first is incredibly important when you try and prioritize among all the different sources that are needed. And uh, these discussions have to be had but at another level, they're premature, because first you have to stop the bleeding. And uh, so having discussion of, re of reconstruction at a time when the people who are supposed to fund the reconstruction are still actively bombing and blockading and causing ever more harm strikes me as somewhat premature. And so I think that it's a good time for planning and thinking about reconstruction in places like Syria and Yemen. But, um, but I think we should not allow talk of future reconstruction to distract from the urgency of stopping the wars now and uh, trying to allow some kind of progress uh, first. I think on this note, uh, we will call it traps. I mean, you're absolutely right, Mark. Um, the issue of how do you prioritize what comes first when you speak about reconstruction, particularly when conflict is still ongoing, is fundamentally important. I'm glad you brought Yemen up where we've seen one of the worst humanitarian disasters taking place and yet very little very little of the kind of attention needed to uh, look at it. Um, I have to thank everybody. Well, first thank the panel who are actually still with us, even though most of them have come halfway across the world and are quite jet lagged. So uh, a, a great big thank you to Mark, Stephen, Dylan, and Jacqueline, and to our audience who's still with us at 6.30 p.m., and to actually the Facebook audience or the stream live. We have about 500 people watching live. So thank you to you too.